In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. You can see the yellow circle around at Virgo at her hand here. She's holding a branch. The image of this queen of heaven, which we have before us in the constellation Virgo, is clearly that of a virgin. How do I know it's a virgin? Because we call her Virgo, <laughs> right? She's a virgin holding a branch in her right hand clearly the branch in her hand represents the fruit that she presents or gives to the earth that fruit is the birth of the messiah who comes into the earth to redeem the earth and all of its inhabitants from the effects of the fall of adam and the dominion of darkness from isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 through 2 the meaning of this branch all of the ancient religions, all of the religions represented her as a virgin in heaven. They all did. And they all represented that this one would conceive and bring forth an incarnation of God. That's incredible. Here's uh, right out of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 2. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch. See, she has a branch in her hand. Shall grow out of his roots. The son of Jesse is a uh, father of David. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The prophecy said the spirit, that's one. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, that's two. And the spirit of understanding is three. And the spirit of counsel is four. And the spirit of might is five. And the spirit of knowledge is six. And the spirit of the fear of the Lord. That's the seven spirits of God that are upon Christ. The scripture says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Remember Jesus' first sermon he preached? He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news or the gospel, right? And so you see the sp seven spirits of God right there. Now, look at, <clears throat> there's also in her other hand here, I, I've circled it with green. I have a Hebrew a word up there. We'll see that in a minute. Actually, as we go through here, you'll see that, in fact, it's down here. 
What could this possibly mean? We're going we're gonna to read this here. Within the constellation Virgo, the virgin holds within her right hand the branch, while in her left hand she holds an ear of corn, or here it's uh, wheat in this picture. Regardless, it's a corn, wheat, uh, doesn't matter. Within, the, uh, within that ear, what it represents is fruit, by the way. It's the fruit of the harvest. Within that ear of corn, we discover the brightest star... Let me point to that so you see it. The brightest star is right here in this whole constellation. Okay, uh, the, bright, these, the bright stars in the constellation have significance in all these constellations and their names and their meaning. But look what it says here. <clears throat> within, within that ear of corn, <clears throat> we discover the brightest star, star that exists. Within this constellation, the name of that star is El Zimek in Arabic or Semek in Hebrew, uh, both of which means the branch. And you can see that Hebrew uh, word there above that, um, that grain or that corn in her, in her uh, left hand. You can see that's the, that, that's the Hebrew word, Semek, and it means the branch. Upon closer examination, we find a most interesting fact, for although there are at least 27, now this is, this is pretty cool, there's at least 20 separate Hebrew words that may have been translated as the branch. The fact remains that only one of these Hebrew words is used exclusively to represent the particular Messiah who had been prophesied to come. And here it is in her hand, the brightest star in this constellation. Remember the, the uh, Gabriel prophesied that the, the virgin shall conceive, bear a son. Look here at verse 5. Behold, this is, uh, comes from Jeremiah chapter 23, 5 through 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous semek, branch, the Hebrew word there. See it? Semek. And a king. It means brand, and a king shall reign and prosper, shall execute just judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That can only mean one person. It's the Messiah. What I'm telling you is all of the ancient religions said the Messiah was coming out of this personage. Whatever she represented, she was the doorway to bring forth the Messiah. It would be her child, which would be the incarnation of God. Now, they all say that. It came from a common source. They all echo the Scriptures. Even though they're not reading the Scriptures, they're saying and reciting the same prophecy, even though they don't know his name. They don't know who the Messiah is because of the corruption. I warned you about the corruption of this. But see, the truth, the underlining truth is there in uh, Zechariah chapter 6, 12 through 13. Then we're going to read Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. In Zechariah chapter 6, we read, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man who whose name is the branch. Again, the same word. See, it all, we, you know, every time it refers to Christ, it's that Hebrew word, Sabbath. And he shall, same one in the constellation, the brightest star. He shall grow up out of his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. We jump to Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 through 9, and we say, we see here now, O Joshua, the high priest. By the way, Joshua and Jesus is the same name. It's Yeshua and Yahshua. It's just a derivative of the same name. Could be talking literally to Jesus as a high priest and his office as high priest. But there was a person in that time of Zechariah whose the name of the high priest was Joshua, literally. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men uh, wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch, Semek, same word. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua Upon one stone shall be, how many eyes? Seven eyes. Remember when the seven eyes were seen on that lamb? 
they said it represented the seven spirits of God. And I will engrave the graving there of. Remember when he slain the, when he slew the lamb, who put the engraving upon Christ? It was God who slew his son. It is God who did it. He did it for us. I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. On that very day, the iniquity, all was forgiven. All was forgiven for every person living upon the face of the earth. All they had to do was accept it. The message hasn't changed. In 2,000 years, the message is still the same. It's all been forgiven. It wasn't forgiven yesterday. It was forgiven 2,000 years ago on Calvary. Anyone who comes today bases their hope and their salvation upon that one day. I'm straight out of the prophecy of Zechariah. I said when we were talking about all the constellations that each of the 12 major constellations have three deacon constellations. And when you put the four together, they form, they, it's like it forms tw uh, 12 different stories or 12 different books. But the primary sign that goes along with Virgo is this sign called coma. And this, this coma, that's the same woman, Virgo, sitting upon the throne in heaven. And her child is that incarnation that's supposed to come. Do you see that? This is the prophecy right there in the stars that the incarnation of God is going to come through a woman, the seed of the woman. Not just any woman, a seed of the woman which has to be a virgin. He can't come through Adam because Adam polluted the seed of man. But woman, woman, woman's seed is not polluted because the scripture very clearly says the woman, when she... When she sinned, she was in deception. She was deceived. The man sinned with his eyes right, wide open. And God holds the man accountable, not the woman. And the woman is pure, and she represents that doorway into, into the earth. To give birth to the son, the virgin must first miraculously conceive. Why? Because a virgin can't have a child without a seed. But the prophecy said the seed of the woman would come forth. So God must supply the rest of it miraculously. Anyway, to give birth to the son, the virgin must first miraculously conceive. It was only in this way that the child might rightfully enter into the earth and afterward qualify as the kinsman redeemer of Adam. In order to be the redeemer of Adam, the, the law laid out that he had to be the nearest kin relative. He had to be a blood relative. Well, how is he going to be a blood relative? Because all of Adam's children that were his through his seed were all corrupt. So there has to be a seed that can be come through the woman, through the virgin, and yet be the blood of Adam, the blood relative of Adam. How are you going to do that? Only the Messiah could be, could be that perfect kinsman redeemer according to the law. See, it had to be the only, only one. This would in turn allow him the opportunity to regain the lost kingdom. Now this woman began to be considered as the very door that opens to the earth. In fact, if you go anciently, uh, throughout, throughout every of the, uh, the ancient religions, the ancient cultures, the altars were shaped in the form of like an hourglass. It represented the body of a woman and she, because they recognized that she was the door. The, the, the incarnation, the Savior, had to come through the door. And they used to build the altars anciently in the form of a woman. It was widely believed that only by entering through the door uh, might one gain the rightful human authority for the dominion of this earth that had been given to the first man. See, see, you can come and you can claim the authority, but you only have a rightful authority if you are the son of Adam. You must be the son of Adam, and in order to be the son of Adam, you must be born of Adam. Adam and Eve, remember Eve came out of Adam. In fact, I don't know if you know this. You know, 
Who called Eve Eve? God didn't ever call her Eve. You know, the scriptures seem so, somewhat confusing because uh, we, we, we listen to people instead of believing what it says. If you read it, it simply says that God gave to man the whole kingdom, the whole dominion, he gave to man, and the word was Adam, and then he said, and he made man, the word is Adam, he made Adam male and female. It was man who belittled woman by changing her name and called Eve. Now the name, it, it's not that the na name was uh, negative, he called her the mother of all living. Well, that's a, because he was echoing that prophecy. But what I want you to know is at the beginning, when he gave, when God gave this earth the dominion, he gave it to Adam, male and female, he created them. He took the woman out of the man, together they shared in that tremendous possession, that tre tremendous dominion. It wasn't like you, you had... Uh, uh, the, you know, I, some women go through this, they, where the, where the husband says, you'll listen to me because I'm the Lord and the master and God made me that way. Put you under my feet. No, he didn't. You need to repent. If you, if you think that, you need to repent. God put that woman, took her right out of your side closest to your heart. Right. You are equal in the share of that. The man and the woman, in fact, you idiot, man who would say that I should slap you right across the face because the woman is not guilty, held guilty for the, the perishing of the, the, the whole dominion. It was you. That's right. It was the male who's held responsible. How deep was this idea, this concept that in order to have the authority, you had to come through the door and that door was a woman? It's in our scripture. Look at this. John chapter 10, this John chapter 10, verse 1 through 3 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. By the way, do you know what verily, verily means? That's not just, you know, that's not just something, something he, you know, like a Christmas tree, he hung an ornament on there. Say, oh, I, you know, I think I'll add a couple words. Verily, verily. I used to think, what is verily, verily? Verily means honest, I'm not lying. Honest, I'm not lying. In other words, he's almost chastising them because they didn't believe. Every time you see verily, verily, he's, he's, he's trying to set these. It's almost like if he had a highlighter, he would be highlighting this verse. That's why he said, but verily, verily. If you, know, if you miss everything else, don't miss this. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. And what does the thief and the robber come to do? To kill, to steal, and to destroy. You see, Satan somehow, by the murdering through the murdering of Adam, he gained control and dominion. But he is a usurper to, through the, to the throne of this earth. Adam and Eve were given the throne. And you can see him, by the way, in the constellation, both of them sitting upon the throne. In case you don't know. But you see that he said, if you climb, if you come in any other way, but through the woman, through the woman as the door, you're a thief and a robber. He's talking about Satan. And remember I said that according to the holy law of God, the law of God is great. It's wonderful. It's fair. Because when God gives you something with the law says, nobody can take it away. Because that's why he's going to send the kinsman redeemer to restore it to you. And if you've heard of the teaching of the Jubilee, everything was restored to them. When land was given to a family, it was given to the family. You were, the individual was just a custodian. That land was going to be restored to you. You didn't even have a right to sell it away. Adam lost it because he was murdered. But see, even though Satan assumed dominion, the scripture says, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold but climbs up some other way is the, is the thief and the robber. He is the usurper. And Jesus is going to usurp it right back. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. 
To him, the porter, that's the guy standing at the door, the porter opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. So you can see how much this concept was there, even in the New Testament days, in the days of Jesus. On September 23rd, 2017, we were talking about 2020 last, last, last uh, week. On September 23rd, 2017, the sign of Revelation 12. Remember, the, the, the Revelation 12 was the woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, 12 stars on her head, and a red dragon ready to devour her child with, with a crown of seven, sta- seven stars, or seven crowns on his head. The, on 20, September 23rd, 2017, which, by the way, is the Feast of Trumpets in 2017, the sign of Revelation 12, will appear in the heavens for the only time in the whole history of man. In other words, this has never happened ever before. It will be the, in the year, uh, in the Jewish calendar, the year is 5777. In the Bible, 5 is a number of grace and 7 is the number of perfection. But uh, the number uh, repeated three times, which implies completion. What number is re- repeated three times? 5. Then you got 777. There's three sevens repeated three times. Well, what does that mean in biblical numerology. Biblical numeric might well suggest the completion of the dispensation of grace. What are we under right now? The dispensation of grace. The completion of the dispensation of grace means the church is gone. So what this sign is suggesting is in 2017 Feast of Trumpets, the rapture will have taken place. Uh, The Feast of Trumpets is also called Rosh Hashanah. And it's called the Jewish New Year. It'll be the 70th anniversary. This date will be the 70th anniversary of the United Nations Resolution acknowledging Israel as a state. In other words, a 70-year anniversary. The 50th anniversary and Jubilee year for Jerusalem will also happen on this date. 2017 is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation as well as the 50th anniversary of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 2017 is the 70th Jubilee cycle from the Exodus. Jubilee cycle is what? 50 50, uh, years. Every 50 years you have a Jubilee, Jubilee cycle. It's the 70th time there were 50 years that happened since... Moses led the people, the the tribes out of Egypt. It's the anniversary. Now, here is the sign that's going to appear. The sign happened before, but what's going to happen is not only going to include this, but it's going to go beyond, and it never happened before. In 2 BC, this happened. Jupiter, you you see, here's, here's Virgo, right? By the way, do you remember seeing the whole planisphere? The, the, uh, the sun starts at Virgo every year. It goes through the 12 signs of the zodiac. Every year it starts at Virgo. It goes all the way around and ends up at Leo. And then it goes back. Virgo all the way back to Leo. Well, what it, Virgo is the virgin, right? The virgin has a child. And at the end, he comes back as the lion of Judah and the king of kings and lord of lords, right? Well, anyway, here's the Virgo, a virgin, and here's Leo, and there's a, there's a star called Regulus in Leo, which means king, okay? And here's the planet Jupiter, which is also a planet that represents king. Jupiter connects with Regulus, indicating that there's a coming king right before Jesus is born. See the date here? 2 BC. Okay? Right before that happens, Jupiter connects with the star in, 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 uh, reg, in the Leo, which is Regulus, which represents king. So you have the king star and the king planet both connect, but it does something spectacular. It d- just doesn't connect. If it just connected, so what? Right? It's not a big deal. Watch what happens. It connects three times. Jupiter came, it connected with the star Regulus, and then it went along its way, and then it turned around. 
And it came back and it connected back with the star again and it circled it and then it went away and then it came back again and it connected with three times. That was amazing that that that, that happened, but that did happen um, at the time of Jesus' birth, showing that he who was born, a sign in the heaven, that he who was born, the Messiah, was the promised king who would come. Then, as Jupiter leaves, here's Regulus the star, as Jupiter leaves in its natural course, Venus catches up with Jupiter. Venus actually represents the Messiah. <clears throat> Venus rep- comes and it connects with Jupiter and it gives us what we call the Star of Bethlehem. You all heard about the Star of Bethlehem. Remember this? The wise men said, We saw his star. And so you had the Star of Bethlehem, right? 17th June 2 BC is when that occurred. Then you have, right? Remember. The sign of Revelation 12 is what? We have this woman who is a virgin who is going to have a child. The child will be the Messiah. Remember, she's clothed with the sun. The moon's under her feet and 12 stars are on her head. And they're right there waiting for the child is what? The serpent, right? Or the dragon. He's got a crown of seven stars on his head. Or seven horns with seven crowns on his head. You see, this is a serpent right there ready to receive the child when he's born to try to devour the child. The planet Saturn is there in the constellation at the time Jesus is born. And the Saturn is equivalent to Satan. Also, you see, if you go up to the, the serpent, you see up there, there's the, the constellation Corona Borealis, which is a crown of seven stars. Seven stars of Corona Borealis form the crown on the head of the serpent, which is the very picture we have in Revelation chapter 12. What happens next? Now here with the eye, this is what you see in the heavens. If you, if you see the, uh, co- the constellation Corona Borealis, this is what it looks like. Now the lines aren't drawn there. I have them drawn there just like you would if you were kind of connect the dots with the Big Dipper. We all know what the Big Dipper is, right? But here's this constellation and this, what it, this is how it appears. Okay, and this is that same crown that goes on the serpent's head. Now you'll remember from a previous... Uh, a previous teaching when we talked about the um, the Christian Empire, Byzantine Empire, that was overtaken by the Muslims. Remember, supernaturally, the sign of Islam came over for four. What was it? Four hours over the city. It was a supernatural event, and we talked about that. It was supposed to be a full moon. Supernaturally, this sign went. But I thought this might be relevant, so I just put it in there. Maybe it's not, but look at this. If you match it up, I, all I do is turn the sign a little. It looks very similar. And we know the sign was the sign of the enemy that went over in, in the, Christian, um, the Christian kingdom, the Byzantine Empire, which was the Eastern Christian kingdom, was destroyed at the time by the Muslims. And the supernatural event happened. And you'd have to go back to previous video. But, but look, at the this, this sign is very similar. And you see this sign on all the Muslim flags, right? <clears throat> so here, we, here we're back to 2 BC, the coming of Jesus' birth, on the Feast of Trumpets, 2 BC, the Venus star, which represents the Messiah. Remember, it had, it had met Jupiter. Remember, we talked about that. Well, now it went on its way. Here's Venus. Um, represent, it entered Virgo just behind Mercury. What is Mercury? Mercury is the messenger who was sent to Mary before the Messiah would come to the virgin was the Gabriel, the angel, the messenger to say, you're going to have the child and he's going to be the Messiah, right? And so the stars actually do that. And remember the sign of the woman is she's clothed with the sun. You can see her, you can see it radiating as she has the sun, uh, sun here. 
And you see, see how close the moon is? Remember the moon was under her feet? So her, the moon is... But remember we said that the sign in all of its splendor does not has never appeared like we're going to show you in uh, 2017. Here we are on 2017, September 23rd, 2017, which will be the Feast of Trumpets. Here we have Jupiter that moved at this time. Here we have the moon almost directly under her feet. We have the virgin who's, a, who's going to have the child. The child will be caught up. Here we have an amazing thing happen here. Leo the lion, the constellation consists of nine stars. So above her head usually is nine stars. But the Bible says, according to the sign, that there, she has a crown with 12 stars. Look at these planets line up. Three planets line up to form with the constellation to form a crown on her head of 12 stars. You could actually see it better here. In fact, it's more clear. Those three planets are Mercury, Mars, and Venus. You see how they, there's nine stars and then the tenth one's Venus, the eleventh, and, and Mercury is the twelfth. It all happens at that time to fulfill the sign there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet... And upon her head, twelve stars, she being with child, cry, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. This is going to happen on the 22nd of September, 2017, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. What, what is so important about this? Remember, the sign shows two things. It's not so much the woman. The woman's the sign, right? We, now we see, this never happened before, we see a, a woman in heaven fits all the criteria the same way when the Messiah came, but now she's got a crown of 12 stars, right? What does, when we read the Bible, what does it say? The woman's child was caught up to heaven. That's the rapture. Right? And the second thing that happens is the dragon was cast down from heaven. And this is all going to happen the 22nd of September, 2017. yesterday on 725 while I was editing the video if you guys caught yesterday's video I walked you through the Revelation 12 sign with the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and the asteroid Yeshua under her feet with the moon and when I was editing the video the part that I was reading you Revelation chapter 12 verse 2 and she being with child cried and as soon as I said, she being with child, I heard in the spirit, look up child in Stellarium. And I laughed. And I said, Father, I highly doubt there's going to be anything named child in Stellarium. And I heard, just look it up. And I thought, all right, I'll look it up. But even if there is something named child, I highly doubt that it's anywhere near the woman. So I went into Stellarium, and I was on September 19th, the day they're having the seven-year deal, the day that the Revelation 12 sign happens this year. And the woman is clothed with the sun, and the moon is under her feet, and Mars is right by her stomach. With the asteroid Yeshua right by her feet, by the moon. So I listened to what the Holy Spirit told me. And I typed in child. 
And to my surprise, it was right there. And before I even clicked it, I said, there's no way it's going to be by the woman. And I clicked on it and bam, there it is, family. And it rocked me. This is the biggest gift from watching, from diligently seeking him that he's given me. I just got hit with the Holy Spirit. All glory to you, Father. This is amazing, family. So I went back to Rosh Hashanah, September 15th through the 17th. And as you can see right there, that's right when the child is born. As soon as the Feast of Trumpets starts, the child is coming out of the woman's stomach, family. I'll zoom in and show you. Right there, you can see the child is still in her stomach on Rosh Hashanah. And when you go through the hours, you can see on Rosh Hashanah, the asteroid child comes out of the woman's stomach, family. This is so gigantinormous, but it gets even bigger. So I called Daniel Taylor, all glory to our father, and told him and blew his socks off. And he was amazed. He said, you just found it, bro. And I said, all glory to our father in the name above every name, Jesus Christ. So we started talking and watching and shooting epiphanies back and forth. And we realized that if the child is born on the Feast of Trumpets, then nine months ago, there had to be some type of conception. So I clicked on Yeshua and I went back nine months of pregnancy. And the Holy Spirit blew me up because nine months ago from Rosh Hashanah this year, was December 15th, exactly nine months of pregnancy, is when the asteroid Yeshua was coming out of the woman's stomach. It's right here. Bam, bam. Yeshua came out of her stomach. And this is right when Hanukkah started, family. Imagine that. But it gets even bigger. This is stacked. This looks like the rapture. And I'm not saying that the rapture's on any date. What I'm saying is this is looking like the perfect picture biblically as the rapture. Remember, last time in September 23rd, 2017, the reason why most of the people thought that it was going to be the rapture is because Jupiter was in the woman's stomach. Well, the word says she being with child cried. The word doesn't say she being with Jupiter cried. So child coming out of her stomach on the Feast of Trumpets and the asteroid Yeshua coming out of her stomach nine months ago, like the conception, is gigantinormous, family. But it gets bigger. So I thought about the Jewish tradition, how the man goes out and prepares a place for the woman for a year and then comes back and marries her and takes her to that place. Just like Jesus Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm coming back to get you, to take you to that place. So I went back three months, family. Boom, boom, boom. And it's right there. And I'll go back the three days. Because Rosh Hashanah is on 915 this year. This is so amazing and magnificent. Our Father is truly a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now imagine this. Let me paint the picture and put the pieces together. Last year, on 9-15, September 15, 2022, the asteroid Yeshua was clothing the woman with the sun. And one year later, the asteroid Yeshua is lined up with the moon by her feet. Let me go back a year again. Bam. As you can see. Over a year's time, the asteroid Yeshua was lined up with the sun by her head, clothing her. And then a year later, on the Revelation 12 sign, the asteroid Yeshua is with the moon that most people say represent the bride of Christ Jesus. And remember, they are already set up a seven-year deal at the United Nations in New York 
The Revelation 12 sign almost six years ago in 2017 was just the heads up, family. It wasn't actually the sign because we're still here and the stars haven't fell, but they're about to. And I've never seen a picture of the rapture visually, biblically put together like this ever. This blows the 2017 Revelation 12 sign out the water. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up, harpazoed, raptured unto God and to his throne. And that's us, we're going home. Okay, I'm Robert Breaker and this will be our sermon of the week for thecloudchurch.org. And this is probably one of the most important videos that I will ever make. This is a must-see video and a must-share video. So please watch this and please share this. Get this out. This is the proverbial handwriting on the wall, if you will, from God to man. And it is important that we take note when God tries to speak to us. Now, I believe every word of the Bible. And so I'm doing this sermon from the scriptures, but I also want you to see something that's happening in the world today that will make you go, what? I mean, it is, it is super exciting and amazing. And there, there comes a time when you just cannot believe in coincidences anymore because this is more than a coincidence. This has to be God. Now, how do we interpret it? How do we understand it? That's what we're trying to do today. I want to go only to the scriptures, but I also want to show you about something that's taking place. Now, this is entitled, The Revelation 12 Sign, Reborn. Don't look up. <laughs> Why did I say don't look up? Well, I'll, I'll get to that here in a moment. But if you know anything about me and who I am, I'm Robert Breaker. I'm a missionary evangelist to the English and Spanish-speaking people. And I preach online in English and Spanish every week, and I try to bring you a new sermon. Now, uh, I have a lot of followers on YouTube, and a lot of people ask, why? Why do you have so many subscribers? And the answer is the two most popular videos that I did. The first was September 23rd, 2015. In English, I got almost 2 million views on that video. And I didn't set a date or anything like that in the sense of, I think the rapture is going to be on such and such a day. Rather, I said, wow, all over the internet, there's people that are talking about this certain day, September 23rd, 2015. So I said, I'm going to make a video about it and show you all the things that they're saying. Well, I did the same thing again on September 23rd, 2017. That was my most watched video. In English, it got almost 10 million views. And there was something that took place in the stars on September 23rd, 2017, that I thought was worthy of talking about. And I still think it is. I still think we should talk about that. And it ties into Revelation chapter 12. And we'll look at that here in a moment. But a lot of people have been following me since then. A lot of people told me they've gotten saved through my ministry. And I praise the Lord for that. A lot of people tell me, Brother Breaker, you got me back into the Bible, to read the Bible, and to discern the times of when we are. For we believe that we are definitely in the last days. So Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, the Bible says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Now this is a prophecy that God gave to Daniel, and God tells Daniel to shut up the prophecy until the end. Well, I believe we are here close to the end. And then it continues and says in Daniel 12, 4, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. We live in a day and age of much knowledge. There is so much knowledge, and it has increased, and it keeps increasing, and we keep learning more and more and more with the Internet. And, and boy, you can sure run to and fro through the Internet. Lots of knowledge going around the world at a rapid pace. In fact, I guess it's uh, the speed of light, if you will, because it's fiber optic cable in many cases and things like that. 
but it's all about knowledge and I think knowledge is key and knowledge is important so I want you to have knowledge and I want you to know something and so we're gonna look at this and here's the word know in knowledge I think you ought to know what's happening in the world in the sky okay I'm gonna leave it at that and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this but I want you to know that there's something taking place in September and I want to ask the question what does it mean now some people will say oh no not this again <laughs> oh for you then don't look up don't don't even don't even go there just don't just forget about it okay but for you that are interested in prophecy and in times in the Bible look up and look into this and see what you think you see I believe in the rapture of the church and Titus chapter 2 13 the Bible says looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ so as a Christian I am looking for Jesus return can't wait now I want to go to Philippians also chapter 3 because the Bible tells us in the book of Philippians as we're waiting for Jesus we're supposed to be looking up so I want to do that I want to look up somebody told me about a movie that Hollywood made a while back and I'm not into movies I don't like to watch movies because Hollywood always seems to have an agenda unfortunately and uh, a lot of what they do there's a lot of bad words and sex scenes and things like that so I don't watch movies I discern them if I do sit down to see one and someone told me about this movie and said brother Breger this movie it's called don't look up and the whole theme of the movie is there's something happening in heaven it's coming to the earth to destroy the earth and then the whole world says that's fake news don't look up and the governments and the and the um, news media and everyone conspires together and they say it's a conspiracy theory no there's nothing coming don't look up and so everyone in the movie is walking around like this and there's just like two people that are saying hey if you'll just raise your head and look you'll see what's happening and yet in the whole movie people won't look up until the end and then it's too late so what I want to ask you to do today is look up look up Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 says for our conversation is in heaven heaven is up from whence also we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself so the Bible tells us that our conversation is in heaven and we who are saved we're going to heaven when we die and if by God's grace he chooses to come before we die at the rapture then we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and we'll be taken up without dying so I'm looking up I'm looking up for the rapture and the Bible says our conversation is in heaven that's interesting what is a conversation well when you talk with someone and they talk back there's a conversation going on so that makes me wonder does God talk from the stars is it possible that the stars tell us something now I'm not into astrology and I'm not trying to push that on you at all but I am into God and the Bible and the Bible talks about the stars and the Bible says something about them and I think it's not a sin to look at astronomy in the sense that we look at the stars and we know well this planet is that planet and this planet is that planet there's nothing wrong with that according to the Bible and I'm gonna show you that in the Bible astrology is when you try to use the stars for your own self gain and uh, you should never do that but is it possible that the great God of heaven put all the stars in a certain order to try to show people something I believe so and I'm gonna show you that in the Bible Psalms chapter 19 and verse 1 through 6 we read the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge so it's like the Bible is saying the stars portray to the world something some sort of knowledge there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard it's like the stars are talking and giving a story their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world what are the words of the stars are the stars trying to tell us something or is, it's almost like the stars are preaching to man which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to his race hmm and their words to the end of the world in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to his race wow we that are saved that are Christians we are the bride of Christ we're waiting for the bridegroom to come 
is God somehow showing in the stars that he is coming for his bride? That's what it sounds like it's saying. Verse 6 says, His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Now, go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. I want you to see this. The Bible is very clear that God, throughout time, has spoken to men through the stars. Now, I don't think we need that today, and I'm going to be very careful with what I'm teaching you today. I'm not saying we should go look at the stars and forget the Bible. No, I'm saying we should always go to the Bible. But if we do look up, we can say, now, where does this line up in the Bible? And that's what I'm trying to do is I want to see. In the Bible, does the Bible teach that the stars are God showing man something? It sounds like it because Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14 says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So God says he's going to use the stars and the suns and the planets as signs. So everything we see up in the heavens, they mark signs and they mark seasons. So God has set up the seasons based upon what the stars are doing. And so we can be down here looking up and going, huh, huh, maybe that's a marker of something. Has there ever been in the Bible uh, maybe a star that was used as a sign? Well, yeah. Remember before Jesus was born, there was the star of Bethlehem that showed up? You remember way back here under a guy named Joshua? You remember when the sun stood still, the Bible says? And so God has used these as signs for people. And, well, who needs a sign? The Jews. Uh, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 22. The Jews seek after a sign. And so oftentimes we find in the Bible God giving signs in the stars. And it's oftentimes for the nation of Israel. This is the greatest cosmic accident and coincidence in all time. That's nothing compared to what's happening right now, this year, in 2023. And around about September of 2023, there is something so incredible that I don't know how I can't do a video on it. I have to. I have to do this video to give you some knowledge so that you'll know what's happening in the heavens. And I want you to look at this because this is what I call the Revelation 12 sign reborn. Don't look up. A lot of people don't want to even look up because if you look up, you might see something from God that might say, hey, I'm up here. I'm real. Come to me. But a lot of people don't want to even think about God. You know, their Bible talks about scoffers, and they run around and say, where's the promise of his appearing? It's like they're running around saying, where's the sign? Just show me a sign. And if there's a real God, show me a sign. Okay? God's up in heaven going, show you a sign. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. And they won't even look up. Well, if you're not going to look up, would you look down at the Bible and read it? People won't even do that, unfortunately. But the Bible is very clear. Now, there are people out there that use the Stellarium program. Do you know what Stellarium is? Stellarium is a program to look at the stars and be able to understand and see what's in the stars. Well, this Revelation 12 sign, we might have been wrong. Maybe that wasn't it, September 23rd, 2017. Maybe that was a precursor to it. I don't know. But what we're seeing now in September of 2023 is insane. And... I'm getting goosebumps right now. <laughs> this is the greatest cosmic accident and coincidence in all time, which would be mathematically impossible as a statistic. It would be the statistics of this happening at this time would be, pun intended, astronomically impossible. All right? There is, and if you'll look on Stellarium, there is a comet that is about right here. And the name of that comet is, are you ready for this? Child. That is the name of the comet. I can't make this stuff up. There is a comet named Child, or an asteroid. I'm calling it a comet. It's actually an asteroid. And this asteroid Child, it used to be like just up here. And it very seldom moved throughout all history. You can go back thousands of years. And it didn't do much. And then all of a sudden it starts moving. And all of a sudden... And this is the only time in history when it moves, it goes over here, and it goes into the womb of Virgo. And that's around September, oh, I want to say somewhere between the 17th to the 19th of 2023. Now you look at Revelation chapter 12, and you look at this sign, and you go, 
Whoa, it just got better. <laughs> it just got more amazing. It, what? How is there this thing called child? And, and, and who named it? What, what are the odds of that happening? And then it just happens to come in here and go right into there and look just like the Revelation 12 sign? That's an accident, right? There's no coincidence. There's no God, people say. And yet you look at it and it's like there's a red flashing neon sign in the heavens saying, I am God, look at me. I don't understand how people can deny God in the Bible. So it, it says there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Now these stars aren't there anymore, but there are other ones up there that make 12. And then you have child. Now there are these other asteroids that are all coming around here too, that are all in this area. And they all have different names. There's one down here called Yahushua, Jesus. <laughs> so you're looking at the stars and you're going, wow, there's a child coming out. And there's a, a thing there called Yahushua, which sounds like Jesus. There's another one called United Nations. That's the name of the asteroid. There's one called Ukraine. And you're looking at this and you're like, wow, what's happened in the news? They're talking a lot about Ukraine. There's one called Israel. Uh, there's one called Laban. Laban, I know that story in the Bible, seven years. Well, that has something to do with seven years. There's one called Elijah. Well, there's the two witnesses that show up in the tribulation, Moses and Elijah. But there's one up here named Heber, or Hebi. That reminds me of Hebrew. That sounds pretty close. H-E-B, H-E-B. So you look at this sign in the heavens, and you begin to focus in on all the different names of all the different stars, and you get a picture of, man, this can't be coincidence. Uh, maybe God is saying, now this is the true sign, and that the King James Bible is absolute truth, and when it says child, it meant the asteroid named child. I don't know, but I'm thinking to myself, wow, coincidence? I think not. I think not. We have a seven-branch menorah, which is very common, which was in the temple, right? And then we have the nine-branch menorah. Now, the seven-branch menorah was all the way through history. And if you can remember, when we first began our teaching, we said that the seven-branch menorah used to represent... Uh, not only represented the, uh, uh, the, remember he had seven stars in his hand? We said that also represent the seven planets that went around the ecliptic throughout the, those 48 constellations throughout the, the heavens. And there was these things called the seven wandering stars. Well, that represented a menorah. Well, how come there's not a nine branch menorah? Because in the days of Moses and, and uh, the Old Testament, you didn't have a telescope. You could only see the seven lights, the wandering stars. What were they? You could see the sun. You could see Mercury sometimes. You could see Venus. You could see um, uh, Mars. You could see uh, Jupiter. You could see, Sa you could see these with the naked eye. So these were the seven. You could see the moon. Those represented the seven wandering stars. And they were called the wandering stars because they, they followed the sun all the way. The, the sun went around 360 degrees around that planetsphere of the heavens. And those planets revolved around the sun, right? But there was only seven, not nine. Well... So here's that planisphere I'm talking about. Here's the ecliptic. And the sun always goes along this path. And then when it gets to the end, it starts over again. Just That's what it does all the time, right? And those planets follow the sun because of the gravitational pull, right? So here you have those seven wandering stars. You've got the sun, Mercury, Venus, um, Earth. Not Earth. Earth is not one of them. Actually, you can see up here, the, the, it's not Earth, it's the moon. Okay, then you got Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Why isn't Earth one of them? Why is, why is Earth not one of the wandering stars? Huh? Yeah, because we're standing on it, so you're not going to look up and see the Earth, right? So you see the moon. What is absolutely amazing is that 
years ago, after I got my um, chronological Bible, I realized that all that boring genealogy and all, it was in the Bible, so you could trace from Jesus, you could trace all the way back to Adam. And they created a chronological Bible, and they created, people have put um, times, historical times, along all the scriptures. And if you get a chronological Bible, you'll find out there's about 4,000 years from the time of Christ to the time of Adam. Now, I knew, based upon the scriptures, that the, these stars in the sky were somehow a clock. And I thought, there's got to be, if there's a clock, there's got to be something at the beginning that would indicate that it's a clock. And I didn't know where to look, but I just, you know, I just took, well, roughly, it's got to be roughly 4,000 B.C. And so I used this software years ago. And what the software does is, is the, the, uh, the patterns, the, 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 the planets always follow the same path. I, I finally found a menorah where the planets lined up completely lined up in this form you had the, the now the, in order for it to be a menorah the the uh, the plants the plants have to line up on the ecliptic and the sun has to be in the middle of them and so on September 8th 3997 BC there was this menorah in the heavens which indicated that this was the time of the beginning of the prophetic clock. And when, I, when, I, when God showed me that, nobody else showed me that, God showed me that through, through this investigation, and I was like, I wanted to just scream and shout because I didn't really know I would find something like this. And I thought, well, this is tremendous, right? And so we see about 4,000 B.C., I call it the setting of the clock. You know, we have an old grandfather's clock and you wind it. And you wind it, you wind the spring and then it's set to go, right? Well, God had to at some point in time set the clock. So at four, roughly 4,000 BTC, God set the clock and there was a menorah in the heavens. Seven planets lined up along the ecliptic, ecliptic which is that path around the, throughout the zodiac. Now here you can see it. Uh, you can see uh, see the moon up there on the left hand corner. Uh, you see Jupiter, Saturn. Here's the Sun, Mercury. Um, here's Mars and Venus. Don't worry about Neptune and Uranus and Pluto because you can't see them, right? And you can see that the sun is in the middle of them, just like I said. Here up here you can see, to, to read these, uh, you got the moon pointing to Jupiter, pointing to Saturn, pointing to the sun. The sun is in the middle. Then you got Mercury coming from this direction, Mars and Venus. That's how it lined up. All the planets lined up at that time. To me, that I mean... I, I, I was easy, it was easy enough for me to accept that God was showing me something. Because I was wondering, okay, so in September uh, 3997, so there was this menorah in the heavens, which consisted of the moon, Jupiter, Saturn, the sun, Mercury, Mars, and Venus. So I began to, you know, I got this question on the head. That wasn't enough. I thought it was really cool. But I didn't leave it at that. I, I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. What is God trying to say? What is he trying to show me? Or is this really God at all? So there's a couple of scriptures that uh, are, are of importance here. One is, comes from 2 Peter 3, 8. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But you see the, uh, the yellow part here. It says, uh, uh, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the, with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. We've read that several times throughout this study. How many days did it take God to create the earth? Seven days, right? There were seven 24-hour 24 uh, 24 days on the seventh day he rested. So he was done on the seventh day, right? So six days shall you labor, the seventh day shall you rest. But it also represented 
six 1,000 days, and then there would be a final 1,000 day, which is easily the millennium, right? There's a thousand year millennium. Also, we went to find this. We went back from Jesus. We went back to 4,000 B.C. And that's four 1,000 days, right? And then from Jesus to the present is what? Two, about 2,000 years or two days. And then you have the millennial kingdom, which is 1,000, right? And also, look what's interwoven in the scripture. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It's almost like God is flagging that scripture saying, hey, this is important. You need to get this. One day is a thousand years. Okay, so God, I got this. And then, of course, in verse 12, he says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God again. So it kind of stands out. And this scripture, of course, shows us God saw everything that he made. Behold, it was very good. The evening and morning was the sixth day. The heavens and the earth were finished. All the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now, this is not new to me. Prophecy teachers have said for years and years and years that the seventh day represents a 1,000 year millennial kingdom that the There'll be 2,000 years after Christ, then the millennium will come, and there's been 4,000 or four days, prophetic days of 1,000 years before that, which when we go four days backward, we find that menorah in the heavens, right? So I'm putting together all these facts, and you see that question mark in my head. That means I'm thinking. Okay, so here's some of the facts. We have September 8, 3997 B.C., which shows that that's when God wound the clock. Now, I say here the creation of the earth, but actually it was probably the birth of Adam right around there. Or not the birth of Adam, but bringing forth of Adam. <clears throat> One day equals a thousand years. We got that. Four thousand years is four days until Christ. Two thousand years is two days have passed since Christ. And then the final 1,000 years will be the millennial kingdom. These are our facts. And we have that menorah. That's a fact. That exists. Okay. So I began thinking, okay, if I found a menorah at the beginning of the clock, and this is really a clock, then an alarm ought to go off at the end. That was my thought. But I didn't know where to look. And of course, this would take forever if you, you, know, you go through this one day at a time. Because every day, the planets move. And I'm working with this software, right? I have nowhere to look. But I knew this. Prophecy teachers had said 1948 was significant because that was the year that Israel was born. They used to teach, many of them used to teach, because it said this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. They used to say a generation is 40 years. And so if you add 40 years to 1948, that means the end will come 1988 or before. That's what they used to teach. They said because... It's mo- because everybody always felt like it was so close, right? And so they, but what they used to say was that a generation could either be 40 years or 80 years or 120 years. But they felt like it was happening in their lifetime. In fact, somebody wrote a book, which is, it's kind of funny now, but the name of the book was 88 Reasons Why God Will Come in 88. <laughs> of course, God didn't come in 88, right? But that was saying a generation is 40 years. So we go to the... I went to the next, the next one. Because if it's 120 years, I don't care. I'm not here. I'm not going to live another 100, you know, 120 years from 94. I'm not going to be around. So I figured, okay, so it wasn't 1988, so I'm going to add the 80 years to 1948, and I'm going to use that as a starting place. And so that comes up to... You can see I got the math here. Um, 2028, right? And I started looking 2028, and I didn't see anything. And I thought, well, this is going to take me forever. I, you know, I went, I went like a, a, a few months, and I didn't see anything that even re- remotely looked like a menorah. Because you've got to realize, when these planets are moving, they all have their own orbit, right? This one's going this way, and this one's going this way, and this one's going... And we need to get to a place where all the planets line up with the sun right in the middle. And I didn't see anything like that. And I said, oh, well, may, you know, maybe this is just a farce. May, may, maybe there's nothing to it. And then I had this idea come to me, and I believe it was by the Spirit of God. I said, wait a minute. 
Why would God show the end? Because if you're at the end, you would know it. Right? What good is it, what, what good is it to tell the people who are being judged and they're already raptured and, and all the judgment's coming down that this is the end? Everybody knows the Antichrist is here. So I said, okay, what if the, the clock is set for the alarm to go off at the revelation of Antichrist or the rapture of the 144,000, which would be 42 months towards from the end. So I did that. I subtracted 42 months, and that came to March 12, or, or 2024. And I looked, and lo and behold, on March 12, 2024, there was another menorah in the heavens. And now I'm, I mean, I'm about ready to jump out of my skin. And this is happening, you know, nobody shows me. This is happening in my own house, you know, in my own research. And I'm like, you know, you just want to tell somebody. But, of course, who are you going to tell, right? Who's going to listen? Besides, the Lord didn't tell me to tell anybody. But this menorah actually shows up in the heavens on March 12, 2024, where you got the sun in the middle and you got the planets on either side. So let's look. Now, you can go back on YouTube and you can look at this more. But um, you see up here at the white here, I, I, I say here in my notes, March 12, 2024, it's the time of the end. The mid-tribulation Antichrist will reveal himself in the temple. At this time, you have the, the menorah will be Jupiter, then the moon, then the Mercury, the sun in the middle, which is a servant lamp. Then there will be Saturn, Venus, and Mars. And so if we look here, we can see up here, we see the moon. And we can see, now we don't see Jupiter here, but we see the moon, we see Mercury, um, this is the sun, um, you see Saturn, you see Venus, you see Mars, okay, it says here the next slide will show Jupiter next to the moon, so the moon's up here, so we, we don't see it in one picture, and you see Jupiter up there, and see Jupiter, you got Jupiter in the moon and Mercury, so there's the moon, and, uh, and so now you can see Jupiter next to the moon. So you see the whole menorah, right? And you, like I said, you can, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. You can review this on YouTube. It'll be there. So then I was getting really crazy. But now this, is, this didn't all happen in one day. About a couple weeks later, I got this thought. And I can't remember all the details. But I started thinking, you know, there's something greater than the beginning and the end. There's Jesus' resurrection. And if this is really God's clock, and I just started asking it, because it didn't nullify any. I said, what, what did it look like on the day of the resurrection? And so the Passover actually happened Monday, April 14th, A.D. 32. Look at that. There was another menorah on the day of Jesus' resurrection. This is the way the planets looked. And we'll, we'll see this in a moment. But you know what, what's freaky here? Remember, there's only the seven planets in the menorah because the menorah has seven stems. And, and with your eye, you can only see seven planets. But at the time of the end, we know with a telescope that there's more planets. There's Uranus. And Neptune, and some people say Pluto, but Pluto, they say now Pluto is not really a planet. But we're really not looking for three anyway, we're looking for two. Remember the two stems were called the what? The two witnesses. And I thought, wow, is it possible there's two witnesses? And, and I mean lined up, right? Watch this. Here, here's, here's these, here's the planets, and here's Uranus and Neptune. I call two witnesses, and I call Pluto a third witness because you know the scripture says, "In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established." Right? This is what happened. This is like, this is like freaking me out here. Okay, so. At the time of April 14th, A.D. 32, you had the sun in the middle, and you had on, on the left side, you had Uranus. You know, and, and note, notice here, the two witnesses, one's on the left, and one's on the right. Just like 
Hanukkah, when we brought those two candlesticks and added it, there was a vacancy on the left and a vacancy on the right. And at the time of the resurrection, there were two witnesses witnessing and testifying to the effect, to, to the fact that Jesus had rose from the dead. And here you see Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, the moon, the sun, Venus, uh, Mercury, Mars, Neptune, and Pluto is right there as well, which is fantastic because, you know, to get seven planets lined up, it happens. I mean, it, it doesn't take a miracle for it to happen. It does happen. Now, it doesn't happen so much when there's, a, there's an actual sun in the middle of them, because then now you're adding some, you know, you're adding some uh, factors to it that that are con- that have to fit, right? But to have not only nine but ten line up, that's amazing. And now you can see, you can actually see them here. Uh, this is this is the time. Um, So the the way you can read it across here, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Moon, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Neptune, and Pluto. That's what we're looking for. Well, here's Saturn. Here's Jupiter. Here's the Sun. And you can see the Sun intersecting with the Moon. The Moon and the Sun are are right next to each other. You see, that's what the two circles are here. And then Venus and Mercury, you can't see them all. And uh, you can see Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter on this side. And here you can see from Neptune, you can, or you can see Mercury, Mars, and Neptune. So if you go back through, you can see that they're all lining up like I told you. Um, these are just uh, three different perspectives of it to, so we could fit all these um, planets in. And look at, uh, this was kind of an after, I thought, well, where's Pluto? Look at Pluto's on the line too. I had, I, I had no idea that this would happen. This happened on the day of the resurrection. All nine planets lined up with the sun in the middle to create a Hanukkah menorah with Pluto as a third witness. That is just absolutely amazing. Also, you see this circle with the dot? Remember there were two circles that were intersect. If you just spin it a couple hours, all of a sudden you got the moon overlaying the sun. You have an eclipse. What happened when Jesus was crucified? There was an eclipse, remember? Is this, is this cool or what? So, so this is what we have, April 14th, A.D. 32. So we got this nine branch menorah, so that's evidence. So now I got my question on my head again. I start saying, I wonder, I wonder, what about the two witness planets at creation? Because when I looked before, I was only looking for the seven menorah, remember? So let's go back to 3997 BC, and lo and behold, You had the two witnesses did line up, and they both lined up on the right-hand side, which doesn't sound real significant, except they are all in a line, right, which is almost miraculous, but both of the witnesses are on one side of the spectrum. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool because Pluto was also close. And, of course, you can see all the planets lining up here. And and this is where Pluto's at. Now, it's not on the line, but it's close. Because Pluto is so far away from the sun, it can be almost anywhere. And to have Pluto that close is amazing also. But here's the two witnesses. Here's a witness and here's a witness. But it's on this side, okay, of the sun. So I got to thinking, okay, when the earth was created, there was a menorah in the heavens. There was, um, you had the menorah, uh, you uh, you had the two witnesses. But I said, okay, so what about the two witnesses at the time of the end? Because I didn't look at that before. And lo and behold, the two witnesses at the time of the end menorah, they were also there. It's just that they're on the left side of the sun. So in the beginning, they are on, at the beginning of time, they're on the one side of the sun, the two witnesses. At the end, 
when the, when, the, when the clock's done, they're at the other side, but they're still in a line forming a Hanukkah menorah. And pay attention to the date, March 12th, 2024. According to what this sign is saying, the time of the, of the end will be March 12th, 2024. God showed me this all the way back in about 1987 or so. But I, never, I would never show anybody. I would never tell anybody because I didn't think God, God gave it to me. He didn't share it. I never heard anybody saying it. But I believe that God told me, um, to, uh, released me to, to tell you because it is so close. The end is so close. And we've seen already, we've seen so many things saying this is the end. This is the end. This is the end. Now here's signs in the heavens, which there's no way we can manipulate this. These are the planets lining up. And so here you, I mean, you can go back, you can review this again. Um, when you got time, you got Saturn, you got the sun, you, and then you got Neptune right next to you, you got Mercury, you got the moon, you got Jupiter, Uranus. You can see here, you see Mars, Venus, Saturn, the sun, Neptune, Mercury, the moon. So here's the conclusion. We have a nine candlestick menorah. All planets lined up. Or, yeah, nine, one of the planets being the sun. All lined up at the beginning, about 4000 BC. Then all of them lined up at the resurrection. And then all of them line up about 2024. Now take that into consideration. We had the four blood moons, which we know is the final blood moon, with the eclipse right in the center of it. And all of the other signs that we've been seeing. I believe it is right at the door.